so uh, good morning. My name is Tomasz Jańczuk. As Lee said, I'm an engineer working for Microsoft, and for the past two years I've been focusing mostly on Node.js. Uh, so today's talk will be about running Node.js on Windows. How many people have used Node.js, first of all? How many people have never used Node.js? All right, so I'll try to do a little intro. Uh, so Node.js project is an open source project that started back in 2009 with the goal of creating a cross-platform runtime for writing web services in JavaScript. Uh, the basic idea was to uh, kind of leverage the skills that front-end developers have authoring JavaScript in the web browser and carry it over and enable uh, the, the front-end developers to write, to utilize the JavaScript skills to write uh, scalable web servers as well. Uh, the basic paradigm of uh, Node.js is that um, the server application is single-threaded and uh, asynchronous. So you get a very similar exper programming experience as you do in the browser, where you basically the JavaScript that you author is also single-threaded. Um, back when the project started in 2009, it was primarily targeting the Unix platform and a Mac. Uh, there was an implementation for Windows that was uh, using SIGWIN as a simulation layer of the POSIX environment. And from there on, the stack built up uh, the, the functionality just as it would on Linux. Needless to say, that implementation was uh, pretty slow and, and inefficient. So a year later, in 2010, Joyent, the, the official sponsor of the Node.js project, and Microsoft uh, kind of joined forces to make sure that the Windows implementation is uh, uses the native mechanisms on Windows and is, and is uh, on par uh, performance-wise with uh, Linux implementation. Uh, as a result of that effort, the SIGWIN layer has been completely re replaced with a native implementation that was calling down to Win32 APIs, native Win32 APIs on Windows. And the 0 0.6 version of uh, Node.js was the first one that uh, supported Windows natively. So ever since then, that was back in 2010, uh, the Node.js platform uh, evolves uh, kind of in lockstep across all the supported platforms. So you can expect the same uh, functional and non-functional characteristics um, across Windows, Unix, uh, and, and um, Mac. As much, uh, the, the basic architecture of Node.js is that um, the, the core of the Node.js runtime contains a certain set of functionality, like you can set up a TCP server, you can set up an HTTP server, um, and there is a certain set of so-called modules that are built into the runtime itself. Uh, so the core of the Node.js runtime is supported cross-platform. Cross that set of functionality works across Windows, Linux, and Mac today. Uh, however, uh, Node.js also supports an extremely rich ecosystem of third-party extensions. Uh, so you can write your own module that plugs into Node.js and enables you to do uh, extra things uh, in, in your application. And there is in excess of 18,000 modules for Node.js available today. And they, they fall broadly into two categories. There are um, uh, JavaScript modules and there are uh, native modules. The JavaScript modules um, are implemented using only uh, JavaScript APIs offered by the Node.js runtime. Uh, and as such, the, these modules have uh, very little problems running across platforms, simply because you have JavaScript language itself acting as an isolation barrier between the underlying operating system uh, concepts and your application. Uh, the same cannot be said about uh, native extensions to Node.js. Basically, unless the, the module author made an explicit effort um, to, to uh, write that module in such a way that it works cross-platform, uh, that, that module may be only usable on a, on a particular platform. And given where Node.js platform came from, it is most likely Unix right now. Although you can also already come across uh, native modules that work only on Windows, and we, we see an ever-growing ecosystem of native modules that work cross-platforms, and I'll be actually talking about one of them later. Uh, so with that, let's just jump into a, a demo of Node.js on Windows. So this is Dante Alighieri. He lived in Italy in the 13th century, and he's famous for writing Divine Comedy. So what I'll do in this demo, I'll take Divine Comedy and uh, stream it from a Node.js server over WebSockets back to the browser, one stanza every two seconds. And I'll do that uh, on Windows 8. So I'm going to break into Windows 8 right now. If you attended any of the Windows 8, I have to log back in. 
you attended any of the Windows 8 presentations yesterday, this is how the start screen on Windows 8 looks like these days. But I'm going to break back into the traditional view. So what that sample does, this is the code of the server. The uh, HTTP server that I'm going to run in Node.js will respond to every HTTP request by serving the index.html file. And that index.html file will then be rendered by the browser. If you look at the index.html file, it is, it is extremely simple. It's kind of the pinnacle of my graphic design skills. So you see the body element with an H1 inside of it. And this is pretty much it. And besides that, it also contains a bunch of client-side JavaScript. What that JavaScript does is it creates a WebSocket connection back to the server from which that HTML was served. So back to the Node.js server. And uh, whenever a message is received over that WebSocket connection from the server, the content of that message will be added to the uh, body uh, of the uh, HTML page. So effectively, you'll start seeing the, the data sent back from the server appearing on the page that you have just uh, accessed. So to run this uh, server, I'm going to use node.exe, which is uh, the equivalent of the node binary on Mac or Linux. And the version I'm using is 0.8.14, which is fairly recent. I think 0.8.15 only shipped a few days ago. Uh, so I'm going to start the server. Go into the browser and navigate to at least on port 8888. And sure enough, you see the Dante's Divine Comedy streamed to us over WebSockets, one stanza every two seconds. So let's have a look at what was going on on the wire here. I'm going to refresh this request. So you basically see two requests being made by the browser. First is the request for that static index HTML page. So we get back 200 OK with some text HTML. Then the JavaScript on that page starts running, and the first thing it does, it is establishes a WebSocket connection back to the server, and this is that second request. The server acknowledges the WebSocket connection with uh, 101 switching protocols, and going from there, and going from there, you, you start receiving individual uh, frames over WebSockets. So this is like a persistent TCP connection almost with some lightweight fra WebSocket framing on top of it. And the server is, uh, keeps sending the, the divine comedy back, back to the client. So this is how the, the simplest case of running Node.js on Windows looks like, which is pretty much the very same experience you would get from running a self-hosted Node.js application on Mac or Linux. So let's have a look at the different ways you can run Node.js apps on Windows now. What we have just saw is the picture on the left-hand side. This is basically the standalone node executable. And that picture actually looks exactly the same on Mac and on Linux. The basic architecture of that uh, self-hosted node case is that um, the operating system handles the incoming TCP connections. The TCP connections are then handed over to a libuv layer in Node.js. And libuv is an, um, actually a Cross open source cross-platform library that abstracts away the various ways of performing I.O. across Linux, Macs and uh, Mac and Windows. On top of LibUV, you've got that HTTP layer of Node.js, which uh, provides uh, parsing of the HTTP protocol. And on top of that, runs, uh, runs your application. So this is one way of running Node.js across platforms, including Windows. And this is what I have just demonstrated. However, on Windows, you also have a different way of running Node.js apps, and this is uh, called IAS Node. IAS Node allows you to host Node.js applications in the uh, inside of the Internet Information Services, uh, which is Microsoft's web server on Windows. In case of IAS Node, the, uh, the incoming TCP connection is first handled by HTTP.sys, which is kernel mode uh, HTTP implementation built into the Windows operating system. The HTTP.sys hands over uh, the, the request to IAS and IAS node, which in turn uh, relays that HTTP request to a node.exe process over named pipes. So we have a little communication using HTTP over named pipes going on between the IAS worker process 
and the node.exe process. So this is a much heavier stack than the self-hosted case. So you may ask, okay, so what's the benefit of, of using IS node? And, and there are several advantages that uh, IIS node brings to the table. So first of all, there is process management. In case of self-hosted node, you actually have to be very explicit about starting the server itself. So you have to say node.exe and provide server.js as the parameter to start it up. Uh, uh, IAS provides um, message-based activation. What that means is that you don't have to start up node.exe up front. Uh, HTTP.sys and IAS will actually intercept the uh, activating HTTP request, and when there is no uh, node process to handle that request, IAS node will automatically create it for you. Uh, as part of that functionality, IAS and IAS not also provide health monitoring and recovery. So if you have, uh, for example, an uncaught exception in your um, uh, Node.js application, which would normally bring down your Node.exe process, uh, IAS node is actually capable of handling that situation and it will respawn the Node.exe process for you automatically. Uh, in contrast, when you're self-hosting, you basically have to pull in uh, some extra module or operating system functionality to achieve the same result. So on Linux, you could, for example, use an upstart uh, mechanism, or there are actually some um, uh, tools written in Node.js itself that help you do that. Another benefit of hosting in IIS Node is related to scale-out. Uh, I mentioned at the beginning that uh, the basic architecture of Node is that every Node process is single-threaded. Uh, given that, a single Node process can only saturate up to one CPU core. On a typical server machine today, you have multiple cores. So in order to fully saturate a multi-core server, you have to uh, create multiple Node.exe processes to handle the same application. In case of self-hosting node, there is actually a, a module called cluster, which helps you do that. Uh, uh, when you use cluster, you spin up multiple child processes, mul multiple child node processes to handle your application, and you have one master process that manages the lifetime of the child processes. So this requires you to write some extra code in your application to, to be very explicit about using cluster. In case of IAS node, that functionality is actually built in. You don't have to write any extra code. IAS node knows how to create multiple node.exe processes that will fully saturate the, the CPU on a multi-core machine. Uh, another set of benefits that IAS node brings to the table is related to diagnostics. And for that, I'll actually switch back to Windows 8 to do a little demonstration. So IAS node comes with a set of samples, and I'm going to use them for this demo. Um, so, when you're writing a Node.js application, one of the diagnostics mechanisms that you use quite often is kind of printf style of debugging. So you basically write out something to the console, like I do here. So in this line of code, I'm basically dumping the HTTP request headers of the HTTP request that just arrived. And when you're self-hosting your node, node application, the output generated by console log will just appear in the console from, from which you run the node.exe. In case of hosting your application IIS node, the question is what happens with that output? So IIS node allows you to capture the standard output and standard error streams of the node.exe process and save it in a file on disk. Moreover, that file will be self saved in a location that um, IIS itself can serve a static file. So uh, uh, the end result of that is that you get access to the logs generated by your uh, node application uh, from the browser using HTTP. So let's see how that works. So I'm going to run this application a few times just to make sure that something gets logged to the files. And now right here from the browser, I'm going to navigate to a special directory that IAS node uses to dump the log files. So what you see here is actually a response generated not by the Node.js application itself, but by IIS. Uh, because the files exist on disk, IIS is using the static file handler, because it's just a, just a web browser, so it's using a static file handler, handler to serve the default document, which in this case is an index HTML. So IIS node, in addition to capturing the output of standard output and standard error, will also maintain a little index HTML, which is up to date with all the log files that have been created. So from here, you can go and navigate to a particular um, log file. 
and basically inspect the output generated by your console log and con uh, console error statements in the Node.js application. Uh, another interesting uh, diagnostic tool that IIS Node brings to the table is integration with uh, Node Inspector Debugger. Uh, how many people have used Node Inspector? A few. Uh, so Node Inspector provides you a, a, a debugging experience for uh, Node.js applications that is quite similar to the built-in debugging experience for client-side JavaScript in Chrome. So let's see how it looks like. So this is a simple hello world application. It just returns the version of IS node and node.js um, that you are using. To debug that application, all you have to do is just to append a debug um, path segment to the URL. And you basically break into the debugger uh, for that application. In here, you can go ahead and set the breakpoint on the line that will be called whenever a new HTTP request arrives. And now I'm going to take that URL and I'm going to navigate to the actual application, not the debugger. And you see that the breakpoint had been hit. So from here you can go ahead and basically inspect the request object, modify any values, set other breakpoints, and so on. Right? So uh, this is something, that this m basic mechanism of using Node Inspector to debug Node.js applications is something you can also use with a standalone uh, Node executable. However, it requires extra setup. So basically what, what happens, you have to first run one node, e node executable that runs your application, passing a special parameter to make it debuggable. Then you have to run a second uh, e Node executable that runs the debugger and associate them to with a TCP connection. So IAS Node does it all automatically for you. The added benefit of that uh, setup is that it allows you actually to debug applications in shared hosting environments. Doing that um, setup of Node Inspector manually require you to have physical access to the box normally. So in shared hosting environments, you rarely have rights to basically go and log into the box which runs applications from other people as well. So in case of IS node, you can actually pull it off without logging into the box. When you're done debugging, you can just kill both the debugger and debuggy processes remotely as well. One last interesting um, mechanism added fairly recently uh, to IS node that helps in debugging is called IS node debug header. The basic idea is that uh, IAS node can add a special HTTP response header to every HTTP response it generates, and that applies both to regular HTTP responses as well as uh, WebSocket handshakes. Uh, so that HTTP header just regenerate this response. That response header looks like this. And it contains a lot of diagnostics information that would otherwise only be available to you if you had physical access to the box. And only then, some of that information is not available until you start really debugging the, the IS or node.exe worker process. Uh, so you can glean some of that diagnostic information just by looking at the value of that header, but if you look closely, you'll notice that this is actually a URL. So let's grab that URL. and paste it into the browser. So you get a much richer visualization of the diagnostic information associated with that particular HTTP request. And this is done using just client-side JavaScript. There is no backend for that URL. This is a static, static HTML, so to say, that does the trick. It uses also Google charts to give you the memory consumption of the various processes. So what, what kind of information can you glean from that? First of all, there is processing time of this particular HTTP request. In this case, it was two milliseconds. This is the time between IAS node saw the first byte of the request to the time uh, IAS node uh, received the first byte of the response from node.exe. Um, then there is named pipe connection retry count, which has to do with the communication layer between the IAS uh, worker process and node.exe which happens uh, over named pipes. Uh, so whenever that number is uh, large, that may indicate that you have a quite heavy initialization logic in your application, which is sometimes the case in case of express apps, where you are setting up a number of routes up front in your app. Uh, 
Uh, then you get information about the actual server machine, the uh, IAS worker process identifier, and the node.exe process identifier that handled this particular request. So in case your application is scaled out either to multiple processes on a single machine or to multiple servers, you, you can actually pinpoint the exact process that was processing this particular request. Then you get information about memory consumption, both uh, from the IAS uh, worker process, uh, which runs the IAS node code, as well as the node.exe that processed your request. And finally, you get some performance counters around um, uh, what's going on in the system right now. So you get information about how many active requests there are um, in the system. And this is helpful uh, whenever you have a situation where, where you have an apparent leak of HTTP request. It, it may sometimes be the case that you receive an HTTP request in your Node.js application. And in the, b before you get a chance to actually complete sending the response, an uh, exception is thrown in your code. An exception that you may be handling and, and um, ignoring. However, the end result is that from the perspective of the Node.js runtime, the HTTP request is still active in the system. So if you see the number of active requests ever growing, it may indicate a leak like that in your Node.js application. So that insight would, would is, is kind of hard to glean without this level of diagnostics. Then you have some other performance counters around, around the total number of HTTP requests processed in the lifetime of this um, IAS worker process and uh, number of node.exe processes handling this application and so on. Uh, so this is uh, pretty much uh, the, the key benefits that IAS node brings to the table. And at this point you may ask, okay, so what's the price I'm paying for it? And yes, of course, there is a price. And if you look at that stack, it is apparently much deeper than a self-hosted case. So uh, it is only to be expected that performance will be affected by this. Uh, however, it is, that, that, um, uh, it is not as clear cut as it would appear at first. If you look at an average Node.js application, like an express application, it typically consists of two kinds of endpoints. You'll have dynamic endpoints, so endpoints for which you always have to run some JavaScript code to generate a response. But you may also have um, static endpoints, so uh, endpoints that serve, let's say, JPEG files, static CSS, uh, client-side JavaScript, basically content that doesn't change, in, in which case you're basically using Node.js as, uh, as if it were a static file server. So uh, running such application in IAS and IAS node allows you to redirect the request for static content to be handled by IAS itself using a static file handler, which is a, a purely native implementation and it's extremely efficient since you know, this is what IAS started off doing. This is really a web server at the core. It is good at serving static content pretty darn fast. So if you take that um, average application where accessing dynamic endpoints uh, incurs some performance penalty compared to self-hosting. But serving static content gives you a huge performance benefit compared to serving it through Node.js. If you combine on average, it, you, you may find that an application like that actually performs better uh, hosted in IAS and IAS Node than in case of uh, self-hosting. Of course, this is very specific to your particular application. So you have to go and measure the, the actual um, effect. So with that, let's switch gears a little bit and talk about Windows Azure. So Windows Azure is a hosting environment operated by Microsoft. Uh, there are several data centers uh, around the world, which allows you to run applications written in .NET, Python, PHP, and Node.js. And there are four ways you can run Node.js code in Windows Azure. So first of all, you can go in and uh, reserve your own virtual machine. It doesn't have to be Windows. Actually, we support a number of Linux flavors as well. Last I checked, uh, there was Ubuntu, CentOS, and uh, SUSE Linux, I believe. We basically work with third parties to provide these images for us. So the, the list of images changes over time. Uh, bottom line is having a virtual machine, you basically have administrative rights. You can go ahead and run whatever processes you want on that box, and that includes Node.exe. The added uh, value that uh, Windows Azure provides in this case is that you can actually create multiple instances of the virtual machine. You can cluster them together, and Windows Azure will provide a basic load balancing functionality uh, 
uh, for that web farm for you. A step up from a virtual machine is something called hosted service. Uh, so hosted service is like virtual machine in the sense that you have complete control over the, the box and the software it runs. You still have administrative rights to the box. You can go ahead and run whatever process you want. But Windows Azure also provides extra layer of um, uh, administration on top of that virtual machine. So for example, it will go ahead and, and install operating system patches for you automatically or it will provide uh, quite rich health monitoring for your application. So whenever your VM goes down, it is actually within the SLA of Windows Azure to automatically provision a different VM for you and deploy the app there and, and you don't have to worry about these aspects. You don't have to worry about your VM going down or, or, or you know, some software malfunctioning on that VM. Uh, also, the load balancing in case of uh, hosted services is slightly more mm, advanced. In particular, it allows you to very seamlessly upgrade your application. So there is a problem of, uh, you know, whenever you have a, your app deployed to a, a web farm, and you are upgrading that app, basically releasing a new version, uh, there is that problem of inconsistency of, you know, how, how do you stage that deployment? So uh, in case of hosted services, actually Windows Azure helps you, helps you with that uh, while maintaining the full application uh, responsiveness. So a, a part of your cluster of the hosted services will be always available running a version of your application while the other uh, part of the cluster is being upgraded. So th this gives you basically zero down downtime uh, uh, capability for your application during the upgrade. Uh, another way of running Node.js on Windows Azure is using Windows Azure websites. And this is probably the easiest way to actually get the first exposure to Windows Azure when you're developing a Node.js application. Websites are primarily targeting HTTP applications. So unlike uh, virtual machine and hosted service, you cannot deploy, for example, a UDP server or a raw TCP server uh, to websites. It has to be an HTTP application. Um, the dis uh, distinguishing factor of uh, websites that makes it particularly appealing to Node.js developers is uh, the ability to deploy using Git. And there are two ways of doing that. Uh, first, uh, Windows Azure can actually provide a Git repository for you, a private Git repository for you that is associated with a particular instance of a website. And you publish your application basically by pushing the bits to that Git repository. A sec in a second mode, you can actually use a third party Git repository, like a, if your app is, for example, hosted on GitHub. And then via post receive hooks associated with the GitHub repository, Windows Azure can pick up any, any changes you are pushing to GitHub and automatically refresh your application in, in Windows Azure. And the last way of running Node.js on Windows Azure is actually fairly, fairly new. This is the Windows Azure mobile services. Mobile services is a highly curated environment for writing backends for mobile applications. So if you're uh, say an iPhone or a Windows 8 developer uh, and need to write a backend for your application that is capable of storing data, managing push notifications to all the devices and so on, this is, uh, this is, this is basically the, the segment that mobile services uh, targets with the offering. If you want to be going deep into mobile services, there is a bunch of videos that, that you can watch online. But Interestingly, this is actually the fastest growing um, service on Windows Azure right now. Um, so given these four ways of running code on Windows Azure, the question is how do they uh, compose with the two ways of running Node.js on Windows? So you can self-host uh, Node.js application either in a virtual machine or in a hosted service. So these are the two services that give you full access to the machine with administrative rights, you can run whatever, whatever process you want, and that includes Node.exe. IAS Node can be used across all four environments, and actually in case of Windows Azure web services and mobile services, this is the only way you can run Node.js applications in there, simply because web services and mobile services take a very deep dependency on IAS Node as an application management mechanism. Um, so let's, let's just uh, go into how you, how you actually deploy uh, an Node.js application to Windows Azure. The key point here is that you don't really need to develop that application on Windows uh, to deploy it to Windows Azure. You can develop in whatever environment you want. It can be a Mac, Linux, or whatnot. Uh, 
Um, and then you can deploy to Windows Azure to run on Windows, simply because Node.js is cross-platform today. To make it easier, we have actually shipped a cross-platform tool written in Node.js, which you can install using npm install Azure. Once you install that tool, it uh, enables you to uh, perform a, a number of management operations against Windows Azure, including creating new websites, creating new VMs, hosted services, and so on. Before you do that, however, you have to go ahead and sign up to Azure. And you basically do it by going to Windows Azure. And there is that free trial thing. So you can basically get started for free on Windows Azure. This is, this is pretty much what you get when you get started within the free limit. Uh, so you go through the standard sign-up process. I won't be showing it here because it's boring. Uh, uh, after you do that, you and you s install Win the um, command line tool via npm install Azure, which I have already run here. You get the Azure command. I'm running this on the Mac, by the way. You get the Azure command. The Azure command gives you a number of subcommands to help you manage various aspects of your Windows Azure subscription. The first thing you have to run here as a developer is the uh, Azure account import. So Azure account import helps you download your kind of developer credentials from Windows Azure and install it on the machine so that later you can authenticate yourself as a developer who owns that uh, Windows Azure subscription. And that allows you to push code to it without providing any further credentials. Uh, so I have already done it on the box, so I'll just go ahead and start using the Azure site command, which allows me to create a brand new Windows Azure website. Before I do that, however, let's actually have some code to deploy. Uh, so I'll just scaffold a simple express application here using the express scaffolder. It's called the jscamp1. It was created in the jscamp1 directory. And this is what you get by default created by the scaffolder. I'm going to install the dependencies, which in this case means express and jade and a few other modules. And before I deploy anything to Windows Azure, let's just make sure that this application is running locally on my machine. So I'm going to start the application. It's listening on port 3000. So let's just make sure that Express, yeah. Well, so my application is running locally. It's kind of ready to be deployed to Windows Azure. So what do I need to do from here? So first of all, I'll just create a local repository, a local Git repository in this directory. So git init. And I've got my Git repo. Now I'm going to add all the files that were scaffolded to that repo and commit locally all the files. So basically what I've got right now is a local Git repository with all the files committed to it, but I still have nowhere to push the, the, the application to. So this is where the Azure site create comes in. Azure site, I'm going to create in a new a Windows Azure website to host my um, Node.js application. I give it a name, and I say that I would like Windows Azure to create a remote Git repository for me, such that I have a place to push my local repo to. So I run this. It should take just a few seconds. Okay, so site, site has been created. Uh, one other side effect of running this uh, command from a, a local Git repository is that uh, this command has now registered a new remote in my local Git repository. So if you do git remote, you'll notice that I have a new Azure remote, which basically identifies the remote repository I can push my bits to. So the act of publishing to Windows Azure right now, actually before I publish, let me just show you the, what, what I get by default uh, when I created a website. So Azure site browse. This will just pop up a browser and navigate to jscamp1 azurewebsites.net, which shows me a simple you know, landing page that, shows, that says that that app 
doesn't exist yet, effectively. Right, so I do have an Azure website with no content yet. So if I go back to uh, my command line, I can now do git push, and I will use that remote that has been created for me by Azure Site Create. So I'll say Azure Master. And now I have to provide a, a password to my remote Git repository. And that password had been registered once during that registration pro process that I skipped. So you have to do it only once when you uh, create your Azure subscription. So my bits have been uploaded to Windows Azure. Windows Azure is now uh, running the npm install command on the server for me to fetch all the dependencies of my application, which includes Express and um, uh, Jade. And my app is up and running. So you can go back to the browser and refresh. And Express running in Windows Azure. So you get a similar experience when you're also updating your app. It is basically a few seconds from, from you know, git push to when, when your updated app is up and running in, in Windows Azure. Um, so what you just saw is a very s an example of a very simple application written in Node.js deployed to Windows Azure. But, and at that point you may ask, okay, but what kinds of apps, is it, how real is that environment? What, how complex apps can I deploy there and is it really serious? So I'd like to show one uh, recent case study. Press Association is a f British firm that deals with aggregation and, and uh, distribution of news information. And during Olympics uh, 2012 in London this year, uh, they created an application that was uh, distributing news widgets to a number of global websites like uh, MSNBC and so on. Um, so they've written that application in Express uh, and Node.js and hosted that application in Windows Azure web websites across uh, eight data centers that Windows Azure provides across the world just to provide the best kind of latency experience for uh, the websites that, that are their customers, which are global. So at the peak of the London Olympics, they saw around two billion requests a day served from this entire infrastructure. That was using about 300 20 CPU cores across the eight data centers, and you know that, that amounts to about 45,000 requests a second. Uh, so this is a pit, pretty serious infrastructure. You can really deploy serious uh, apps uh, with it. The one aspect that I would like to draw your attention to, which enabled Press Association actually to pull off this kind of load with merely 320 machines, is kernel mode output caching. Kernel mode output caching is a mechanism that um, allows you to cache the HTTP response to an HTTP request at a kernel level in the operating system for a specific duration in time. And whenever a subsequent HTTP request arrives that looks identical to the original request that generated that response, the, that request to the, second, uh, the response to the second request is served from the kernel mode output cache as opposed to invoking your application code. So to tie it back to that picture of uh, how you run code on IIS node, you'll notice that HTTP.sys layer, which sits directly on top of TCP. So this is actually running in kernel mode. It is part of the operating system. And this is where the kernel mode output caching is implemented. So uh, basically what happens is uh, when a response to an HTTP request is already cached at that layer, and a subsequent request arrives, the HTTP.sys will respond to the subsequent request without invoking the entire stack above it. So your Node.js application will not be even bothered. And interestingly, if you can, uh, if you can enable uh, kernel mode output caching for even very short durations along the lines of one to two seconds, you can really get a tremendous boost in throughput. And this is what uh, Press Association had used in their deployment to, to pull it off. Because in, in their case, you know, the, the examples of the data that they were serving is, you know, current score in a certain game, right? So in case you are serving, serving that kind of content, you can afford to cache it for like five seconds. You know, even if the uh, result changes in those five seconds, it's not the end of the world that some people have to wait four more seconds to get the new result. It's not stop quotes. Uh, so what if 
we were able to take that HTTP.sys component used in the IAS node stack and actually use it in the self-hosted case as well. The idea here is that we could enable using kernel mode HTTP output caching for self-hosted applications on Windows. So on one hand, you would get the performance benefits of running a self-hosted, very lean self-hosted node stack on Windows, and you would get additional performance benefits of being able to use HTTP output cache. HTTP.sys also brings other benefits to the table, uh, namely port sharing and a better management of SSL certificates, which I'll be talking about shortly. But the, the performance uh, benefits was kind of the primary motivation to, for, for, to that experiment. So doing this would really only make sense if we were able to uh, maintain the JavaScript API surface of the module to be identical to the uh, built-in HTTP module in Node.js. So basically, if you have an HTTP application written for Node.js, you can slipstream the HTTP.sys implementation without modifying your application at all, because the API surface is identical. Um, and secondly, the HTTP.sys module uh, does not require any changes in the Node.js runtime at all, neither uh, libuv layer or the Node.js uh, core itself. Uh, so it is basically a third-party native module that you can plug into your application and use it to replace the built-in HTTP module. Um, so let's have a look at the performance results from this experiment. Uh, so we, we've done a number of measurements for both HTTP and HTTPS with and without uh, connection keep alive and a variety of ways of establishing an SSL connection. There are various ways of doing the handshake basically. And across all these scenarios, HTTP.sys performed better than the built-in HTTP stack on Windows. However, the one number that really pops here is the first one, which is HTTP.sys with output caching. So in this particular case, it was a very simple hello world application, and output caching was enabled for one second only. So basically, a request came in, Node.js generated a response, and HTTP.sys cached that response for only one second. And any requests that arrived during that one second were served by HTTP.sys level directly without invoking your application. And doing only that enabled us to boost the performance more than 10 times. So this is the kind of uh, uh, throughput boost you can expect from using HTTP.sys with output caching. So whenever your application can leverage um, output caching, this is, this is something to bear in mind. This is how you enable uh, output caching. Uh, so the uh, first thing you'll notice is that instead of requiring an HTTP module, the very first line requires an HTTP.sys module. So this is where you slipstream the HTTP sys implementation instead of the built-in HTTP uh, stack. And then on the response object in your uh, message handler, you're saying for how long you want to cache that response. So in this particular case, I'm saying cache that response for 60 seconds. So HTTP.sys layer will intercept that parameter cache the response for 60 seconds, so during the next 60 seconds, your uh, Node.js application will not even be bothered uh, to process any subsequent requests that look similar to the one that just generated this response. So the other benefit of HTTP.sys that I mentioned uh, is related to port sharing. Uh, given that HTTP.sys is a kernel mode component, fully trusted operating system component, it can do a subdivision of the URL space on a single TCP port. So what this allows you to do is to basically have two distinct node processes running on the same TCP port on a subset, on a different subset of the URL space. So on the left-hand side, you see one process listening on port 80 slash first. On the right-hand side, you see second one listening on port 80 slash second. So this is an interesting functionality, both in terms of helping you to subdivide your application logic into multiple processes, but also it comes handy in shared hosted uh, environments where you can imagine running these processes under completely different user accounts for, on, on behalf of different tenants. So enough of HTTP. I just wanted to close uh, with... Uh, uh, one other experiment that uh, we've done to solve a problem with Windows Azure Mobile Services, but that problem is kind of generally applicable to all Node applications. Uh, Node.js is single-threaded and event-based, so all 
uh, event handlers in Node.js must be completely asynchronous in order to uh, maintain the responsiveness of a Node.js application. If you have any code in your, uh, similarly like in a browser, if you have any code in your event handler that blocks execution like that while true would, which is kind of an extreme case, um, then your application becomes completely unresponsive because it cannot process subsequent events. So effectively, your Node.js app becomes a zombie, right? It's still spinning and using up CPU, but it doesn't do any useful job. So what can be done about it? That problem had already been solved in, uh, in the browser itself. You'll sometimes get a pop-up saying, you know, the JavaScript on this page appears to be misbehaving. Do you want to stop running it? So this is typically a manifestation of a runaway JavaScript that contains some kind of an infinite loop that doesn't return control to the uh, browser itself. The similar problem exists in Node.js, except Node.js doesn't contain any mechanism to help you get out of that situation automatically. However, the underlying V8 uh, JavaScript engine that Node.js uses uh, does contain a mechanism uh, that uh, the very same mechanism that is used in the browser that uh, can help you get out of that situation. So what we've done is we've written a little tripwire module. So what this allows you to do, it's actually a native module that is cross-platform. It runs on Windows, Linux, and Mac, and it's on GitHub, so you can go and see. Um, that module allows you to register a time limit for the execution of the JavaScript event handler. In this case, it's 2,000 milliseconds. So after that while true loop spins the CPU for 2,000 milliseconds, the V8 JavaScript engine will actually throw an exception into the JavaScript code, an exception that cannot be caught by the script. So if I put a try-catch around that while true loop, it wouldn't catch that exception at all. Uh, however, the Node.js runtime is really the piece of code that orchestrates calls into the V8 uh, engine, and it can catch that exception, and it will turn that exception into an uncaught e exception handler. So you can get back control into your Node.js application after uh, detecting that your uh, Node.js app is run away, and you can possibly do some kind of a logging to dump the context. Go ahead. Uh, it's, not to get the stack it's not. It's not possible to get the stack trace, but the tripwire module allows you to pass in a context in a call to reset tripwire, a context that you can later retrieve from within the uncaught un exception handler. So there is some cheap way of passing some context around, but unfortunately, the Node without changes to Node.js runtime itself, it is not possible to get the stack trace. So this is pretty much uh, all I had, but this is just a tip of an iceberg of what we are doing in, in Microsoft around Node.js and Windows. Fortunately, most of it is open source, so you know, feel free to go to GitHub and explore. We also take contributions, so if you feel so inclined, you're more than welcome to help. And I'm open to questions. Thank you. Oh, that was fantastic. Questions? Hello. I have two questions. Uh, how does HTTP.sys interact with logging if, if my Node app is, is not executed at all, you know? Uh, logging at which level? At the level of the Node.js application, like the console log? Well, I would say more abstract. I'm, I'm building an application and I want to know, let's just say, how many requests per second I'm processing to, you know, to my users. Yeah, so, so you know, the, the kind of added benefit of actually using HTTP.sys is that HTTP.sys is already very tightly integrated with a variety of uh, logging and diagnostics uh, mechanisms on Windows. So you get uh, event tracing for Windows where you can literally trace the lifetime of every single HTTP request at the operating system level. You also get a very rich set of performance counters around um, HTTP processing. Okay, thank you. And the other thing, just as, is a bit of feedback. It looks like there was an update to the Azure package, and now it's Azure-CLI uh, to get the Azure. You're using 067? Yeah, we've been working on it like the week before I left for Singapore. Yeah. So, so just yeah, by the way, I just installed it, and it's Azure-CLI now. Okay, thank you. Thank All right. You. Good questions. Other questions? So, how does the HTTP sys work together with uh, no, with node proxy or a node cluster. 
So does it take over the node cluster functionality by replacing it with like the IIS stuff or? So you, you mean the cluster module in Node.js? Yes. It's fully supported. So you can basically run the very same code you run today with the cluster module and the built-in HTTP stack. When you slipstream the HTTP.sys stack works the same way. Right, uh, but IIS node is not going to replace the cluster module or something because it thinks that IIS is better support of doing multiprocessor stuff. So just coming back to this picture, you know, the HTTP.sys is used in two contexts here, right? You can, uh, it's involved either in the IIS node stack, which involves IIS web server, but the experiment I was talking on about last is basically using just the HTTP.sys uh, uh, implementation of the HTTP protocol, which is built into Windows, is a replacement for the HTTP stack that Node.js ships with, right? So when I said you can use cluster module, I refer to the leftmost picture here, right? So this scales out to multi-core machines using the regular cluster module functionality built into Node. Awesome. More questions? Anyone? Anyone? Ah, there we go. I have some um, ideas on how to secure HTTP connections, like using SSL or authentication. Yes, so um, in a regular Node.js application, when you're setting up an HTTPS listener, you basically have to provide your SSL certificates right there in the application code. In case of HTTP.sys, given that HTTP.sys is a kernel level component, you have to configure um, SSL credentials for your application using a certain set of tools that Windows ships with. So basically you have to invoke a command saying, uh, you know, coming back to, uh, coming back to this picture. Actually the configuration of SSL certificates is very tightly associated with the notion of that URL registration. So you can, you can actually have, uh, you know, you can, you can specify what certificate you want to use for a particular port number. And whoever makes a registration on that port number with HTTP.sys will basically automatically use that HTTPS certificate. So you can still specify your certificates in code, but once you slipstream the HTTP.sys implementation instead of the regular HTTP sys module of uh, HTTPS module of Node.js, uh, these certificates will simply be ignored and instead the ones that you have specified at the system level will be used. So the reason this is actually nicer is that, you know, typically you would store X509 certificates for a, um, uh, for a Node.js application in a file, simply because, you know, all the samples steer you in that direction. Storing your SSL search with private keys in a file is not a particularly bright idea in general, right? This is not uh, the most secure way to store credentials. Uh, Windows has the notion of a certificate store, which is uh, basically the way to handle your credential security. It's kind of a moral equivalent of a keychain on a Mac. And uh, the, the, the way you specify credentials when you're using HTTP.sys is using that certificate store, basically. We can do one more, I think. Sorry, one more question. Just a novice IIS question. It sounds like IIS scales or helps to scale across multiple cores. But um, if once I start scaling onto multiple computers, is there anything that IIS can help me, or am I once again sort of building things from scratch for, my, for myself? So IIS is, uh, is just a process that runs on a particular machine. Once you are into the world of scaling out to multiple servers, you have to have additional layer of infrastructure, some kind of a load balancer in front of the, the web farm that will do it for you. So Windows Azure provides that for you automatically, right? You literally have a slider saying, I want to have 27 instances. And at that point, you don't care that the traffic is just load balanced for you. OK, great. So uh, great to hear Node on Windows. We've had a while, but it's really getting solid. We've got integrated inspectors, diagnostic, an amazing Azure stack. Let's hear it for Tom Yenjak. Thank you.